money, love, power, people don't realize that they are following a shepherd. But we are following the good shepherd. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, is one of the most famous passages in the entire Bible. And I want to go through it verse by verse with you and uncover and explain some of the truths that are hidden and contained within this powerful chapter. It's broken up into two parts. And the first part represents God as the faithful shepherd leading his sheep. And the second part represents God as the king or a host um, having his faithful guests uh, celebrating a banquet at his table. Now David wrote this psalm and he's familiar with both of these roles being both a shepherd boy, having to tend to the sheep and also being a king who would have hosted many guests at his table. So the psalm starts off with, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Now take note here that the role of a shepherd is to guide, to protect, and to provide provision for his sheep. Jesus in John chapter 10, 11 said that I am the good shepherd and he is the ultimate example of a shepherd. It says in this verse that we shall not want, that we can enjoy absolute contentment and peace and satisfaction in him. Because the sheep only need to know where the shepherd is. They don't need to know where the pastures or the waters are. As long as they know where the shepherd is and they follow the shepherd and stay by his side, the shepherd is the one who would lead them to everything that they need. Verse 2, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. And this can refer to the abiding place of God. We're not just passing through the pastures and the waters, but we are stopping and we are feeding on them. We are finding rest in this place. And these waters remind me of the waters that Jesus talks about in John chapter 4, 14, where he says to the lady at the well, I will give you waters, waters from which you will not thirst ever again. These are living waters which are welling up to eternal life. And these are the waters that the shepherd leads us to leading us to himself, the living waters, in which we will never thirst again. He restores our soul, and he leads us in right paths, or it can be phrased paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So as we're there abiding in his presence, he brings restoration to our soul, a, a vitality and a life which comes, a spiritual life, only as we take rest in him. You may be depleted, you may be weary, but he gives us rest. And it also says that he leads us in right paths, which is these paths of righteousness, moral paths, which are not a burden to us, but are rather a blessing. And we find rest in them. The only true peace that can come is in these paths. It reminds me of Matthew 11, 28 to 30, where Jesus says, come to me all who are weary, all who are heavy laden, all who labor, and I will give you rest, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. And he leads us in that path with him, with the help of the Holy Spirit, in which we experience the lightness and the peace of walking in the righteousness of God, free from sin. The scene then changes to a valley in, in verse four, where it says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. And we see here in Judah, in, in, in the desert valleys would be a place where shadows could lurk as you're journeying through them, as there may be bandits or animals or flash floods and there is suspense and danger. This verse, uh, the, the, the valley of the shadow of death can also be termed the valley of deep darkness. And in this life, we will have to journey through these seasons and periods of deep darkness. But note here that it says the valley of the shadow of death. The, the shadow of a serpent can't sting us and the shadow of a sword can never kill us. 
and the shadow of death cannot touch us and harm us because it was dealt with on the cross. We are not journeying through the valley of death itself, but only the shadow of death. And also where there's a shadow, the, the presence of a shadow indicates the presence of light, which must be shining. And God is the light who is with us in the valley. It goes on to say, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So the reason that we're not to fear evil is not because of the absence of evil, not because of the absence of our enemies. Our enemies will be present in the valley of deep darkness, but God will also be present with us. And his rod and his staff are metaphors for, for him fending off the enemies, protecting his sheep, putting them aside and protecting his sheep as he fights off the enemies. And we needn't worry about the enemies because the shepherd is our perfect protector. And he fights for us and he wins the battle. And we can enjoy safe passage through the valley of darkness, no matter how scary it may seem, as long as we keep our eyes on the shepherd who defeats our enemies and leads us through safely. This uh, particular part of the psalm reminds me of the book, The Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan, I think written in the 1600s. If you haven't read that, I would recommend that you do. It's a wonderful book and it talks about all of these journeys through the, the various stages that we go through in the Christian life, including the valleys of deep darkness. A really great allegory, a Christian classic, which what I, would, I would highly recommend you read. And then verse 5, uh, the analogy changes to a king or a host uh, hosting his guests at, a, at his own table in a banquet where they can enjoy as much as they want. It says, for you prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. And even though there are the presence of the enemies there, we can focus on God and not our enemies. This may represent a, um, a celebration, a, a, a victory of, of uh, the enemies being captured. You might imagine them in chains, chained up on the side of the sides, looking on um, as we are enjoying this feast, completely helpless to be able to, to, to prevent our enjoyment that the, that the king gives us and that they can see the victory that we are having without being able to do anything about it. Anointing our head with oil reminds me of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. God has given us his spirit to make us sons and daughters of God and has anointed us for a purpose. And here in this, in this passage, it says that he is anointing our head with oil. He is setting us apart. He is calling us apart. He is giving us his spirit, calling us his, putting a mark on us that identifies us as his. And no one can stop it or do anything about it. The cup also can represent the cup of salvation overflowing so full in abundance that it never runs dry. It is just overflowing and that salvation can overflow in us. We can, we can experience greater depths and measure of it all the time. Greater measures of him himself who is our portion and our reward of our salvation. There is always more to enjoy. It is always running over full. And it will never run dry. And then verse 6 concludes this great psalm. It says, Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And this word surely doesn't mean, oh, well, surely it'll, it'll <laughs> you know, goodness and mercy will follow me. It means certainly. It means, it means assuredly, without doubt, goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. It doesn't mean that our circumstances will be perfect in every, in every way. What it means is that the goodness and mercy of God, no matter what we're going through, it will follow us all the days of, we life, of our life. We, we have access to the provision. We have access to him. It reminds me of Lamentations chapter 3, uh, 23 and 24. Um, the great is his faithfulness. New are your mercies every single morning. And they will follow us without end. This verse can also be rendered. All the days of our life are without end. And we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You look back to the Old Testament times when the Levites, the priestly tribe, had special access to the house of the Lord that others didn't. But today as believers in the New Covenant, we have access, full access to God, which was unthinkable back then. 
access to, to worship him before his holy throne without restriction, without limitations, to worship him in the holy of holies. The, 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 the holiest place before him is, is our reward, is, is our salvation in Christ. And the significance that this verse would have had to those people then would, would be mind-blowing. Access to something that they could not possibly imagine and that they look forward to with anticipation and something which we can take so for granted in our own lives. We are to seek our happiness in the presence and service of our Lord in this life and have hope of enjoyment of his love and presence in heaven. Friends, everyone is following a shepherd of some sort, whether it's, whether it's God himself or whether it's materialism or whether it's uh, money, love, power, People don't realize that they are following a shepherd. But we are following the good shepherd. As Jesus calls himself in John chapter 10, 11. And he is the shepherd who leads us to rest. He is the shepherd who gives us protection from our enemies. He is the shepherd who guides us in right paths. And he is the shepherd who promises us protection and security forever in perfect happiness and bliss in the presence of the Lord all the days of our life and in the life to come. I would encourage you friends to memorize this psalm. This is one psalm that I have memorized and it is so deep and rich for so many occasions that you want it stored up in your heart so that you can just bring it to recollection and feed on it when you don't have access to the Bible right in front of you. There's something so great about storing up the word of God in our heart. And this is one passage that I would encourage you to do so. I pray that you've been blessed by this study. I hope that you've learned something from it. Please leave any questions or comments below. And uh, may you continue to follow the shepherd and enjoy the wonderful celebration and feast that you have in Christ at the King's table. Bless you, friends. We'll talk to you soon.